good evening uh, and welcome to OrthoHub. Um, my name is uh, Ramon Tamasebi uh, and uh, I am a uh, hand and upper limb surgeon from King's College Hospital. Uh, I'm delighted to be uh, hosting my first OrthoHub event and uh, in a moment I'm going to uh, introduce our panel for the evening uh, but uh, before I do I'm just going to do a couple of tiny little bits of housekeeping. Uh, firstly, uh, I'd like to remind everybody that we've got some fantastic podcasts on our website already. Uh, these websites, uh, podcasts can be downloaded. Uh, they cover a whole range of subjects. We've got things about resilience, uh, mental well-being, uh, foot and ankle surgery, uh, leadership. And uh, we've had 7,000 podcast downloads in uh, over 50 countries. Uh, Lee Van Rensburg has kindly offered to do an elbow uh, podcast for us in the next uh, couple of weeks and we'll put that up on the site soon. Um, in terms of our next webinar, uh, we're planning some uh, more content for you in mid-October. Uh, the next one is going to be about the spine. Now, uh, before you all switch off and say that you're all upper limb surgeons and not interested in the spine, this is going to be a really inclusive event and uh, the uh, key is going to be that it's going to be spine for everybody. Whether you're an upper limb surgeon or a lower limb surgeon or a trauma surgeon, it's going to be spine uh, that we can use every day. So uh, it'll be as inclusive as we can make it. Um, the panel today, I'm sure you're all familiar with. They've all been uh, influential in, in our understanding of elbow surgery and elbow trauma. Uh, Lee Van Rensburg from Cambridge, uh, Jorge Orbe from Miami, and Adam Watts from uh, Wrightington. So they need very little introduction from me and uh, uh, they will uh, take us through a, a fantastic evening of lectures this evening. A very brief word uh, about our sponsor for this evening. Uh, Leader Orthopedics uh, have got uh, a great background and pedigree in upper limb surgery and that's why they've sponsored this event. And the reason that we have sponsors is so that we can keep OrthoHub uh, a community that's free and open access for everybody and through ongoing support from sponsors, We'll hope to maintain that as we move forwards. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to our first speaker who is Adam Watts. Thank you very much, uh, Roman, and uh, to the team from uh, OrthoHub uh, for the introduction. Uh, I hope you can see my uh, my screen share there okay. Um, so I've been asked to talk to you about elbow fracture dislocations and uh, to talk to you about, uh, in particular, the Wrightington classification uh, for managing these injuries. Uh, these are my disclosures. But what I'm going to take you through um, in the next 15 minutes is the, um, uh, the basic principles that I apply to managing uh, these injuries. Um, and then the structure of the uh, right to classification and how that can guide our management. And along the way, I'll, I'll give some tips and tricks for managing these, uh, these complex injuries. So the approach to instability is to understand the anatomy, uh, to recognize the patterns of injury, to have an algorithm for management, and once the patient uh, or the elbow is stable, get the elbow moving immediately. So no casts, no splints, no um, braces, immediate active mobilization. And this uh, uh, technique of lying the patient supine uh, using gravity to keep the forearm on the end of the humerus will, uh, will, is the best way to start the, uh, the mobilization. So the first principle is that the anatomy of the elbow joint is asymmetrical. So while we've got osseous stabilizers, ligamentous stabilizers, and neuromuscular stabilizers, they, on the uh, medial side of the joint, the osseous stabilizers are key. The distal humerus is covered through an arc of nearly 180 degrees, a bit like the hip joint, you've got very good bony stability. And the ligamentous structures and the, neuro, uh, the neuromuscular structures are of less importance. On the lateral side of the elbow, 
we've got very poor bony coverage of the disc humerus only through an arc of only 90 degrees and therefore the the neuromuscular stabilizers the ligamentous stabilizers are of much greater importance and that's really important to consider as we're going forwards when we see an x-ray such as this uh, of an elbow fracture dislocation often the uh, the elbow is reduced uh, and it's very easy to get distracted by the obvious injury, the radial head fracture that's staring us in the face. To, all too easy to ignore the more subtle coronoid fracture that's lurking behind. But actually the coronoid tells us how to manage the injury. Traditionally, we've thought about the coronoid uh, looking at it in a lateral projection. And the Regan and Mori classification uh, considers this projection and the height of the coronoid that's lost. The problem with this approach is that a grade one Regan and Mori uh, injury can, which may be thought of uh, as a sort of fairly benign uh, injury, actually can be associated with fairly significant instability. These are all tip of coronoid fractures, and each of those is actually very unstable. So Driscoll brought to our attention that actually the coronoid is a fan-shaped structure. And just as in a fan, which doesn't have a tip, the coronoid doesn't have a tip. What the coronoid has is two facets. It's got an anteromedial facet and it's got an anterolateral facet. And with, in combination with the radial head, this provides the bony buttress that prevents the forearm from subluxating off the end of the humerus. So we like to think about the, uh, the uh, elbow in th in using the three column concept. So we've got a lateral column, which is the radial head. We've got a middle column, which is the anterolateral facet of the coronoid and a medial column, the anteromedial facet. And the fulcrum for varus valgus stability lies between the anteromedial and the anterolateral facet of the coronoid. We need to have a pillar either side of that fulcrum to maintain stability. And clearly the radial head has a bigger moment arm than the anterolateral facet and is more useful as a bony stabilizer. And actually if we've got the anteromedial facet and the anterolateral facet and the soft tissue stabilizers, then probably the anteromedial facet, the middle column is not important. So how does this then translate into the Reisenton classification? So this is entirely based around the coronoid injury and the coronoid injury is going to dictate how we manage the, the, the injury that we see. So a type A is an anteromedial facet fracture, a type B is a basal fracture or bifacet fracture with or without a radial head fracture, which would be a B plus if there's an associated radial head fracture. A type C is a combined anterolateral facet fracture and a radial head fracture and also fits in with a comminuted radial head fracture in isolation because the management is essentially the same. And then a type D is a fracture which is distal to the coronoid, a diaphyseal fracture with or without a radial head. And the third principle that I want to share with you is that the soft tissue injury can be anticipated from the bony injury. Sometimes there'll be little flake avulsions that we'll see on our x-rays or CT scans that will indicate what the associated injury. But we can infer from the bony injury and the classification which, injury, which ligaments are likely to be damaged. So with a type A, the lateral ligament complex and possibly the posterior medial band of the medial collateral ligament. Type B, the, the, the anterior ligaments may well be intact Posterior band of the MCL may be torn, the posterior lateral uh, ligament may be torn. A type C, terrible triad type of injury, the lateral ligament complex is typically torn, the anterior band of the MCL may be torn but may be intact. And then a type D, you may have a tear of the lateral ligament complex. So let's look at these uh, injuries um, individually. So this is a, a type A pattern, which is your typical posterior medial rotatory instability described by Sean and Driscoll. We've got a tip of coronoid fracture, so-called, 
by uh, we've got a double arc sign and we've got a delta sign so narrowing of the joint sides joint medially this needs an mri scan uh, sorry a ct scan or an mri scan to determine the nature of the injury and what we can appreciate this is a fracture of the anteromedial facet it's associated with a lateral ligament injury because as the patient falls there's this this um varus thrust on the elbow uh, and uh, external rotation of the humerus and the, uh, the lateral ligament cools off as a sleeve, and you can appreciate in the bottom right-hand corner that lig lateral ligament complex has been pulled off, and we know we need to fix that to restore stability. If the coronoid fragment is very small, they're actually easier to fix arthroscopically, either with threaded K-wires or with headless screws or cannulated screws over a wire. If the injury is multifragmentary, then wires or screws are not going to be sufficient. And often, if it's involved in the sublime tubercle, we'll need to use a buttress plate. Uh, and there are lots of different plates on the market that uh, are specifically designed to address that. And I'm sure Lee will talk more about the approaches for that. The question remains, do we need to treat all of these injuries uh, um, with surgery? Do we need to fix the posterior band of the medial collateral ligament? And these questions remain unanswered at this stage. But I would certainly uh, uh, encourage you to take these injuries very seriously and to certainly consider surgical stabilization for, for these, because the penalty for getting it wrong is very rapid onset osteoarthritis in the elbow, as you can see here, within 12 months of the injury. So that's the algorithm for managing these. A type B or, uh, pattern is a bifacet fracture, which is your typical Montegia, like a lesion or Montegia fracture in most cases. And Ring classified these as apex anterior or apex posterior, which is really helpful. So this is the apex anterior type in which the radial head fracture escapes. So that's a B type pattern, intact radial head, which is dislocated. We don't have to fix the radial head, but we need to address the coronoid. And here you can see this big coronoid buttress fragment, which we need to capture and fix. And we can also see that the anterior band of the medial collateral ligament and the posterior band is attached to this fragment here, and that needs to be fixed as well. Don't try and fix them through your plate. Fix them with independent lag screws, and then use your plate simply as a neutralization plate. The B-plus injury is a worse injury. It has, carries a worse prognosis because the radial head is fractured. You have this coronoid fracture, radial head fracture dislocated, lateral ligament may be torn. And in this situation, very often it's easier to tackle the coronoid first through the electron fracture, address that, and then uh, fix your ligaments, and then uh, fix the uh, radial head and then the, the, put your plate onto the electron. And even with a fairly complex injury, you can achieve a satisfactory outcome following this uh, algorithm. So it's always fix the coronary first, independent lag screws, get good fixation of that. The type C pattern is the terrible triad type of injury. And it's really important to understand what a terrible triad is. It's a valgus external rotation injury. And if you can see here on this CT scan, the anteromedial facet is intact because it moves away from the humerus as the arm goes into valgus and external rotation. The anterolateral lateral facet is fractured, so that's the typical fracture, coronoid fracture with a terrible triad injury. And of course, the radial head is fractured. And we'll hear more about how to manage the radial he uh, head from Jorge. The question about whether we need to fix that anterolateral facet in my practice, I don't fix it, and I don't think you need to fix it, and that's supported by others. So in my practice, I don't fix the coronoid if it's a true terrible triad. I fix, replace the, or replace the radial head, importantly fix the lateral soft tissue structures because they are very, very important to the stability of the elbow. And if it's still unstable, then fix the medial sided structures. This is very important. So this is not a terrible triad injury. Yes, it's a coronoid fracture and a radial head fracture, but it's a bifacet fracture of the coronoid process. And this is a direct posterior dislocation, and it's a different injury. It's a B plus injury and shouldn't be managed in the same way as a terrible triad because you do need to fix the coronoid in those cases. 
And then the last group of, uh, of injuries is, are, are the diaphyseal fractures. These are distal to the coronoid process. The coronoid is in continuity with the electron process. It can be with or without a radial head fracture, whether it's depending on whether it's a flexion or extension type of injury. And the, the key uh, to these is that you've got to get the rest, restore the length of the ulna first before addressing your radial head, because you need to know the height to restore your radial head to and fix the lateral ligament complex if necessary. So that's the right into classification, which we hope is a useful uh, way to think about these complex injuries and a useful way to, uh, to classify the, uh, the, the fractures. And for each of these classification categories, we have an algorithm that, uh, for managing the injuries that we can apply to, uh, to the treatment of our patients. One of my junior colleagues, Zaid Hamoudi, has done some excellent work in, uh, in validating uh, the writing classification. And it's been shown to have excellent inter and intra observer re reproducibility and reliability based on CT scans, which are really important to understand these injuries. And most importantly, it's also been validated against interoperative findings and has got good uh, validity. Also really importantly, looking at my own patient cohort, if you apply the algorithms that we've described uh, in this talk to these injuries, then pretty reliably you can expect good outcomes, working closely, of course, with good uh, physiotherapy colleagues to get the best outcomes for our patients. Thanks very much indeed uh, for the invitation to talk tonight, and thanks very much for listening. Um. Fantastic. Adam, thank you very much. Uh, a, a brilliantly concise uh, but excellent talk. Um, at this point, I think it would be a good idea if we were to uh, stop and take a few questions. Um, let me uh, just uh, share my screen. Um, Okay, so um, first question has come from uh, the audience. Uh, Adam, do you feel that there's a particular time or an ideal time to go in and fix these fractures? Let's say you've seen somebody in the very acute setting and they've got a, uh, a hugely swollen elbow, uh, pretty full of blood. Um, do you feel that that in any way influences or compromises your uh, soft tissue approach, your um, uh, anatomic soft uh, tissue planes? Uh, would it be something that you'd like to leave for a few days before taking to theatre? Uh, no, I, I, I think you should try and get the patient to theatre at the earliest available opportunity. Now, it, depending on your practice, that may not be immediate, but uh, but... The most important thing is that the right person takes the patient to theatre at the right time. Uh, so somebody who's comfortable in managing the injury. If you leave it for a few days, the swelling is actually only going to get worse. So that's not an advantage. If you really delay the treatment, we know that delay in managing uh, these fracture dislocations is associated with a greater risk of heterotopic ossification. Uh, and that, that's probably because of upregulation up of the genes that then then uh, lead to HO uh, um, synthesis. If you think about it in evolutionary terms, if you're a hunter-gatherer and, and you, uh, you dislocate your elbow, what's the best thing that can happen? Well, the best thing is to throw out lots of bone, give you an ankylosis so that you can at least continue to, to have some sort of function. Uh, and by intervening early, you can hopefully stop that process from from occurring and that so i think the earlier you can intervene the better uh, but obviously the, the important thing is that it's somebody who's comfortable in managing the injuries that takes them to the theater okay that's great i'm just going to pitch a couple of other questions now to include uh, the rest of the panel in your talk adam you mentioned that you don't really like to use splints and supports uh in the post-operative setting um 
do you do you feel that there's do you just let them get going with just minimal bandaging or do you feel that even a, a few days of a, of a back slab for pain support might be uh, useful no a, a back slab is a very good distraction device you're adding weight to the forearm um and so uh um the the uh, i would certainly not encourage its use and i would particularly not encourage the the notion that the patient can leave the ta operating table with relative stability. And if I stick them in a cast, then they're going to be okay. Because I can guarantee you when you see them back in the fracture clinic, they will be dislocated. They have to be absolutely stable on the operating table before you're happy to get them moving. We do um, use a sling for comfort. Um, and, uh, but we have them out of the sling every hour doing exercises during the day. We don't uh, get them up through the night, but every hour during the day, out of the sling, doing those overhead exercises. And the value of the overhead exercise is twofold. First of all, it, it uh, gives better stability because gravity is keeping the humerus on the end, uh, the, the forearm on the end of the humerus. But the, uh, the greater advantage in my view is that it eliminates biceps hypotonia. So in the initial post-surgical, post-injury phase, biceps is hypertonic. The patient's trying to extend their elbow. Biceps is pulling the elbow into flexion, and the patient's not going to win. You lie them down, and you'll immediately get another 20 degrees of elbow extension, um, even on, uh, on day one. So um, that's what we encourage for immediate active, active mobilization. Fantastic. Oh, Jorge, let's bring you in at this stage. Uh, what are your thoughts about the, uh, the patient that maybe, let's just say for the uh, average elbow surgeon who, who doesn't quite have uh, the, uh, the skills and experience that, that you guys might have, and then there's a concern towards the uh, end of the case that in the terminal portion of extension, the elbow just might be subluxing. Um, and that's something we've all faced before. We've done that final screen and there's just a hint that the elbow just might be coming out in the terminal 10 degrees or so. What would be your, your uh, recommendation in that setting? Because I think quite a few of us have probably been there in the past. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you. So immediately after we finished the whole repair reconstruction, uh, there are two ways to uh, assess whether the elbow is uh, sufficiently stable or not. And one of them is, is by simply holding the arm in space and letting gravity just extend the forearm. If the uh, forearm falls off the distal humerus, that's an indication you have a very unstable situation. You might be doing something about it. The other way is as if, if you dislocate in the last 30 degrees of arc before reaching full extension, you have to, be, you have to do something about it. And what to do, uh, you must stabilize the elbow in some way. You can use transarticular pins. That needs a cast because by themselves, they're unable to hold the elbow in place. You can use uh, external fixator. The static external fixators are very, very uh, uh, stable, but they produce a lot of rigidity. And the hinged fixators are very difficult to apply and poorly tolerated. So my favorite way of doing is to use a small hinge that is underneath the skin, the, the so-called internal joint stabilizer. And that allows you to mobilize them early with the assurance that they're not going to dislocate. Uh, fantastic. And then a, a quick question for you, uh, Lee. Um, in that terrible triad setting, do you have a particular order in which you approach things? Do you feel that it's best to explore the radial side first and to restore the, the, the height or the, the radial buttress? Or do you explore the medial side first um, and try to deal with uh, the, uh, the, the potential instability there? Well, for me, complex instability, which is what the terrible triad is. You need to turn a complex dislocation into a simple dislocation. And then the most important step is to get it moving afterwards. To make an elbow stable, you get an elbow stable by getting it moving actively. So you need to deal with the bony problem. And most often with the terrible triad, the biggest bony problem is the radial head. So you either need to fix the radial head or you need to replace it. You can't excise it. That's not an option for you. Then you stabilize the lateral soft tissues. That's a given. There's always a little bit of a debate about the coronoid. And I talk about terrible triads with a capital T, the ones that really scare me, and the terrible triads with a small T. And there is a spectrum to the terrible triad injury. But generally, you don't need to fix that bony component 
of the table trout. I'll definitely agree with Adam on that one, particularly when it's just a small piece. But uh, I do like to repair the anterior capsule because I want to give my elbow proprioception. Because I want, when this patient wakes up, them to have the confidence, which they get from my eyes, to get their elbow moving. So they don't wake up in a back slab. They wake up able to move their arm with the confidence that they need to start moving it because that's what will stabilize it. So I first fix or replace my radial head. I, in preparation, that's debatable, get the capsule ready for transosseous sutures, repair my lateral collateral ligaments, and then exactly like Jorge says, they're stable to within 30 degrees of extension. Because if they're stable to within 30 degrees of extension, that elbow is stable enough to then go for early active range of movement, which will stabilize the elbow further. If at that time point, they're not stable and congruent to within 30 degrees of extension, that's the time when I'll turn my attention to the medial side. Because you'll often find that they've ripped the medial collateral ligament, they've ripped the common flex origin, but by just doing a good lateral substance repair, I don't have to go around the medial side and mess with the ulnar nerve. Because if you go around the medial side, the ulnar nerve will bite you. And also no one yet has shown that you, that you get a better outcome by repairing the medial structures. So yes, nearly everything laterally, check whether they're stable at each time point. And when I get them stable to within 30 degrees of extension, my job is done. Okay. Wake up and get the elbow moving. And just to pick you up on one of the points you made, your, your preferred method of fixing the uh, lateral structures is transosseous sutures? So, so most times the lateral structures can be ripped off anywhere, but most of the times in the context of a terrible triad, they will come off your lateral epicondyle. So they'll come off the, the and so I'd normally put an anchor dead center into the center of the, the capitellum. So normally it'll be a trans, uh, anchor into the capitellum and then uh, fiber wire or similar sutures uh, mass repair of my lateral collateral ligamentous complex, complex dense origin. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Roman, thank may I just uh, just raise one point and, and uh, it, um, just to challenge Lee on the proprioceptive concept of the anterior capsule, the research that's been done looking at the joint elbow joint proprioception shows that the anterior, ca anterior capsule is actually almost completely deficient of proprioceptors. All I've the been wasting my life is in the oh, ligaments. Man. I've been wasting all my life. Why did you tell me this? Adam, I've known you for eight years. Now you tell me. Well, I've Jeez, heard you man. say it so many times that I thought I, I, I can't tolerate it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So actually, it's the, it's the ligaments that contain the, uh, the proprioceptive elements, and those are the bits we need to be restoring. Thank you. Okay. I knew I signed up for this for a reason. <laughs> so on that bombshell, on that bombshell, we'll move forward. Um, could I now introduce our uh, next speaker all the way from Miami? Uh, Jorge, would you like to uh, talk to us about the radio ahead? Thank you, Raymond. It's a true privilege to be uh, sharing in, in this uh, webinar. And I've put together a little talk on the radial head. Hope you all are seeing it now. <clears throat> and this is my disclosure. So the radial head has been classified uh, in uh, three types, A, B, and C. And they range uh, <clears throat> in, uh, to the point of including the um, elbow dislocation together with the radial head fraction. That's uh, the latest addition to the classification. The type ones are non-displaced and we see these in the office uh, every week we see a couple of them and the treatment here is get them moving early and by a month these patients should be back on their feet. Watch for those that don't want to move because they can develop an anterior uh, capsular contracture and if we are aware of them and we rehabilitate them properly, there should not be a problem. The type 2 fractures are the ones that are shear fractures, like the majority of the uh, articular surface still on uh, the radius itself, but a small segment shears off. Many of these can be treated conservatively too. With early motion, they uh, tend to have very good results, provided that the fragment is not too large. If it is more than 50% of the surface, they tend to be unstable, or there's no bony block. Type 2 fractures can be treated operatively when it's necessary. And most of the time, we use small headless compression screws, and which are quite successful. Type, T, type 3 fractures are the exciting ones, the ones that uh, make it fun. And these are the ones that include the whole uh, articular portion 
of the radial head. Uh, the majority of them are fragmented and they usually fragment in the same pattern. About 50% of the head off is in one piece and the other uh, half of the head is split approximately in equal parts. But some of these type three uh, radial head fractures can be a single extraticular, uh, I'm sorry, articular uh, head fragment. Traditionally, they have been treated by excision to prevent uh, uh, a bony block that, that can uh, develop. Um, the uh, radial head is a very important structure in our elbow and we should not take the radial head lightly. It is a primary restraint to axial load on the radius and is the main bony restraint to valgus load on the elbow itself. The radial head is capable of restoring stability uh, after a type two coronoid uh, fracture as uh, Dr. Watts so eloquently described, the majority of these terrible tribes do not need to have the coronoid addressed. The elbow, I like to compare it to a structure that requires uh, three supports. The olecranon, the least important, the coronoid, the most important, and the radial head, which is quite important too. So in a sense, it is like a three-legged stool, pardon the uh, this is the more rustic explanation compared to the Greek temple columns. But if you lose one of the legs, you are in trouble because you have a problem. Well, the radial head is quite important, but you can live without a radial head because if you have collateral ligaments that are intact or they have healed, you still have a functional elbow. That doesn't mean you have uh, a great elbow. Radial head resection is simple. And it's inexpensive, but it can have long-term consequences. The most common one is the slow development of a, a collapse, longitudinal collapse of the radius, the development of a carpal, you know, carpal impaction syndrome that is usually manifested by pain. But if we follow these patients long enough, many of them will develop osteoarthritis of the ulnohumeral joint also, which might or might not be symptomatic. And the reason they develop it is because the uh, lacking the lateral uh, uh, bony support, the elbow migrates into a slightly increased carrying angle, if you may, and that creates abnormal stresses on the cartilage, uh, uh, promoting early degeneration. Radial head resection is simple and expensive, but it has no place in the unstable elbow. Fixation of the radial head is possible, and it's the right thing to do if you can get away with it. And this is successful when the fragments are not widely displaced. They're still more or less in the same neighborhood and they still have some degree of soft tissue attachment or perhaps blood supply. If you're able to put them together, many of these cases do very well. It is important to apply the place in the correct uh, position. This place is, a, is applied uh, too medially and it impinges in the proximal radial ulnar joint. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, this has been described, Andrew Caputo uh, described the safety zone, which is in a section uh, of the articular head where it never comes in contact with the articular surface. So the sigmoid notch has about an 80 degree arc uh, of articulation. The uh, radial head and the forearm rotates 180 degrees during normal function. And what that does, it leaves about 100 degrees of safety zone that never comes in contact with the sigmoid notch. And that's where your hardware fits. It's important to have plates that are not prominent. Some plates are just poorly designed. The ideal plates have a low profile uh, they, and they have a minimal angular component. So you're not dead center on the safety zone, you're still safe. It is nice when you can adjust and modify your plates to fit your patient. And insight to uh, adjustment is sometimes necessary because it's very difficult to get these radial heads properly reduced and properly fixed. When you find yourself fixing them on the table and perhaps even figuring out that there are pieces that are missing, it's time to think about something different. That's when the radial head replacement comes in. About 50% of the radial heads that you fix on the table either end up in a vascular necrosis or non-union and failure. Radial head uh, uh, replacement is a viable alternative uh, in the treatment of these cases. It's a reproducible uh, uh, operation. Unfortunately, it involves a prosthesis and involves also a cost. Historically, the results have been plus or minus. They have been quite viable. With time, they have changed. But in the past, loosening migration was common, capital erosion, 
and very commonly del uh, delay need for removing these implants as they really bother their patients. The concept I think the originally was they are a spacer. All we want to do is to maintain something that keeps the radius to length. But maybe the real answer here is what we need is half of a joint replacement, a hemiarthroplasty that will do the job of the proximal radial ulnar and the uh, radial capitellar joint. The problem is that the biomechanics are not simple. There's an axial load, but it's also a transverse load. And how about a transverse load? Well, the central band of the interosseous ligament transfers loads from the radius to the ulna along the forearm, and it, it generates a transverse force vector in order to do so. And that is um, the reason that many of these short stem radial heads or these bipolar heads, they always end up malaligned and they often fail. Not only do they become malaligned, but once they are really malaligned, they really disturb the capitellum because the real radial head has to be perpendicular to the axis of forearm rotation. And many of these short stem implants inserted into the neck are not because the neck is an average six degrees up from the axis of uh, forearm rotation. And that means is as you use your form, you're wobbling and you're presenting the capitellum a sharp corner that tends to damage it. Bipolar heads do not help when, they, when you have an unstable elbow. So I think that the ideal radial head should have a long stem to resist the lateral force, should be aligned to the axis form rotation to preserve the capitellum and should be a monoblock for stability. So this is <clears throat> what we have been using for the last several years is a radial head that is aligned to the axis of form rotation. Therefore, when you look at the x-ray, the stem is pointing in the wrong direction because the head is pointing in the right direction. So you need a mechanism that permanently locks them into place. Type four, which is the latest addition to the classification are those radial heads associated to a dislocation. And they include the terrible triad, the, the, all, the proximal ulnar fractures and the SX lopresti. And in this case is what we have to do is repair the bone, repair the ligament, and if we are still unstable, consider stabilizing the elbow. And I want to show um, this case as an example of how to treat the type fours. This is what I call a terrible triad, but a terrible triad with a capital T. It's a big, big piece of capitellum. There's a radial head. The capitellum is not only comminuted, but it's very large. The first thing we do is we replace the head and we, we uh, recut the radius and measure where the length, uh, what is the correct length of this radial head? Why? When you're missing the capitellum, it's quite difficult to see that corner between the lesser and the greater sigmoid notches, which tell us exactly where the plane of the proximal uh, uh, aspect of the radial head should be. So this is uh, somewhat tricky, but um, <clears throat> you should use the fluoroscope for this purpose. The idea here is to prevent overstuffing. We should never have a radial head that is more proximal than the corner between the ulnohumeral uh, joint and the proximal radial ulnar joint, the corners between the lesser and the greater sigmoid notches. So that's where your radial head should be. And it should also be the correct size. I truly believe that they should be as close as possible to the original head. So the dome of the capitellum is articulating in the con concavity of your radial head if you have a concave radial head. If you have a flat radial head, you probably uh, are more tolerant of size mismatches. So we, here we have repaired the coronoid with headless compression screw, which is not a great stable way of repairing coronoid, but after doing uh, your radial head, you provide a great stability to your uh, 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 elbow. And last but not least, I don't trust headless compression screws to repair a large coronoid fragment. So I will stabilize them internally and then reconstruct the lateral structures, including the epicondylar origin, the lateral collateral ligament, and then when we have finally a stable elbow. And this is at four months, we had this motion and that little internal uh, joint stabilizer is to be removed at this time. In conclusion, generally less is more for radial head fractures. If you can treat them non-operatively, that's the best thing to do. Uh, if you have an unstable elbow, the radial head uh, must be treated. Excision is not an option here. You either should fix the head or replace the head. 
<clears throat> fixing a type three radial head fracture is the best thing for your patient if you can do it, but it is technically demanding and susceptible to non-union and AVN. And the radial head replacement is a more predictable and reproducible procedure for uh, fragments, uh, fractures that include more than three fragments, but it is subject to the complications of prosthetic implants. And thank you very much. Uh, fantastic talk, uh, Jorge. Thank you very much. Uh, we are all extremely jealous of the final slide. Uh, I can assure you of that. Um, thanks very much for that. Here's a couple of questions. First one is actually uh, from uh, one of the uh, delegates, uh, not specifically related to the radial head, but a pretty good question to ask all of you is that um, obviously one of the medium to late stage complications is that after a beautiful repair, replacement, reconstruction, uh, the whole operation is blighted by heterotopic ossification. That's something that we see commonly with these really massive injuries to the elbow joint. And of course the elbow is extremely predisposed to that. Are there any steps that you're gonna take almost prophylactically at the time of surgery to try to preempt or to treat this, uh, Jorge, starting with you? Thank you. Well, I, I don't know if any of the steps I take to prevent this actually work, but I do a lot of uh, things to prevent heterotopic ossification. Um, it is a disaster when it first. So I, I agree with um, uh, Dr. Watts when he said that the longer you take to fix the, uh, the, these injuries, the more likely they are to develop heterotopic ossification. That's something we have observed. So I do agree taking to the OR as soon as possible. I do believe in steroids. Steroids reduce swelling and all these orthopedic injuries. And I do think they uh, facilitate early rehabilitation. So I give my patients Decadrone or any intravenous uh, uh, steroid in the operating room. And I follow it by a, a week of uh, uh, steroids by mouth. Um, I think the, it has been said by other surgeons that steroids can help prevent heterotopic ossification. I am not sure of that, but it certainly facilitates rehabilitation. The other thing is the non-steroids. Uh, Indocin is traditionally uh, quoted as a method to prevent heterotopic ossification, and it is difficult for the patients to take a whole month of it or three weeks, which is the recommendation. So we, what we do is we do give them a non-steroidal, but we give them one of the newer non-steroidals that are less irritating to the stomach, and we do that routinely. We still see heterotopic ossification. I really don't know how to completely prevent it. Radiation works, but you cannot use it in fractures or acute injuries because in the tissues, the bone don't heal. Uh, Lee, what are your thoughts on trying to uh, take steps to prevent HO? Any uh, top tips from you? Mute it. That's it. Thank you, Mark. The way to prevent heterotopic ossification is to get that elbow moving. Uh, that study that looked at uh, uh, injury to surgery and the surrogate marker being heterotopic ossification, it's not the time point from injury to surgery, it's the time point from injury to movement. What you need to do is move that elbow beyond the level of strain. We know that the amount of strain defines what tissue gets formed in the gap. And if your strain is more than 100%, you don't even form fibrous tissue. And so early active range of movement right from the beginning. I prevent heterotopic ossification by reassuring my patient that their elbow is stable enough to move. That's the first important thing. I tell them to take painkillers, including non-steroidals of their choice, to take the pain away so that they can get their elbow moving. I don't do radiotherapy. I've never used radiotherapy in 15 years. I have it available to me if I wanted it. The pelvic guys use it, um, but I've never found radiotherapy. So reassurance, non-steroidals for pain relief so they can get it moving and get it moving. I've never used steroids, um, either IV or oral post-op. Um, it's an interesting, I've, I've just never, it's not part of my practice. Okay, uh, Adam, any thoughts from you? Uh, well, as we talked about, I think uh, the early surgery and mobilization, I've, nev I've never used non-steroidals um, because uh, I'm worried about the impact it might have on fracture healing. Um, uh, and we don't particularly see a problem with uh, with HO by not using non-steroidals. 
Um, there is some interesting work out of Canada looking at the use of, uh, of mast cell stabilizers, um, and that is another option. I have no experience of that, but uh, I think the most important thing is the mantra of, of make it stable and get them moving. Yeah, it's a recurring theme in all the talks, really. Uh, Jorge, another question just relating to uh, one of the slides that uh, you flashed up. In these, um, you know, these these really severe, terrible triad injuries, but there's obviously been a huge amount of energy that has passed through not just the elbow, but the forearm. Um, what are your thoughts on the uh, early uh, stabilization or reconstruction of the intraosseous membrane? Because even with, you know, the best surgery, at the time of injury, uh, and let's say that you have taken a great deal of time and care on making sure that the uh, axis of the radial head and the height of the radial head have been uh, adequately restored and that there's good soft tissue and ligament stability, um, in the absence of the, uh, the intraosseous membrane that helps to redistribute and to, uh, to spread the load to the ulnohumeral joint, obviously that's gonna to lead to a, a significant amount of radio capitella joint force where and ultimately failure. Um, have you got any top tips for an intraoperative assessment of the integrity of the intraosseous membrane? Uh, you're on mute actually, Jorge. Sorry for that. So the push-pull test is, is uh, very effective under fluoroscopy. Um, uh, uh, and once the ulna is stabilized, uh, uh, push the radius down, pull it distally, and, and if, if it translates, and you can see the the uh, um, distal ulna and the and the radius changing more than say five millimeters, that is significant uh, uh, evidence that there is a central band injury. Usually, they, they're obvious. There, the, the typical terrible trial does not have a uh, a uh, uh, central band injury, but in the, the high energy injuries, it's not uncommon at all. Uh, I, if we don't reconstruct or repair somehow this, this uh, central uh, band uh, after one of these injuries, the elbow will never be a good elbow. Uh, this central band is, in, is one of the most important ligaments to stabilize the elbow joint itself, because you might have both collateral ligaments intact, but if your central band is not intact, you have this, this parallelogram effect in which the elbow moves from from valgus into varus, sometimes quite imperceptibly, but it ends up in producing problems in the wrist. So I am a big proponent of repairing the central, reconstructing and repairing the central bone every, every time you can. And the way to do it is, is I have been using allograft, interfering screws, bone tunnels, fix the radius, pass the graft through the ulna, pull the radius to length, and then lock the graft under tension, so it's in, it's elevating the radius to its right length. That's when I place in my radial head. This is typically for an SX lapresti injury. Place your radial head so it's not carrying load. It's just supporting your allograft reconstruction. Now, in 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 cases where the in, the the acuity of the injury is, is great and there are multiple other injuries, you don't have time to look to start doing allograft reconstruction. Get a nice uh, uh, a big uh, a, um, uh, synthetic uh, material like the uh, uh, tightrope uh, that is used for the ankle syndesmosis and use it to reconstruct, to repair temporarily or suspend your radius uh, to length and give your real central band an opportunity to heal. This is something that we've started using, uh, doing very recently. We still don't have long-term results. Some people say that the interosseous ligament doesn't heal but I think it has never been given the opportunity to heal because we never were able to do this before. So I do believe in repairing the central band. Okay. Um, another question specifically for you, Jorge, that's cropped up on the uh, question and answer chat, uh, and it's related to your use of the internal joint stabilizer. Um, one uh, technical question uh, is when you're uh, placing the stabilizer, uh, I guess there's one really important step uh, having used it myself not that long ago, which is placing a wire down the central axis. Um, how do you ensure that your wire is down that central axis? Um, and are there any uh, tips that you can that you can offer to try and make sure that we get that in as accurately as possible? Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, the, that was the key uh, problem in developing this internal joint stabilizer is how can we find that central axis? So the solution was very simple. It was to develop a, um, a guide that is about two thirds of a circle and it slips in the waist, in the narrow part of the trochlear, and then you push it medially and it sells a line against the, the medial trochlear expansion. So very ac accurately, you determine the center of the cross section on the medial side. On the lateral side, you have the, the capitellum right in front of you. The capitellum is a hem hemisphere. So if you look at it laterally, you just figure out where the center of curvature is, mark it with a, a marking pin and drill your K wire. And now you have the two points that determine the line that is the axis of uh, uh, ulnohumeral rotation. If you look at it in the fluoro, once you've done it, you should see the K wire right at the, at the, at the axilla of the, of the um, medial epiconda, right at, at the corner coming right out there. You shouldn't go through because the ulnar nerve is on the other side. And then when you look at it in the lateral view, you should be you should see a dot right in the middle of the concentric circles that uh, represent your, your trochlea and your capital. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's keep things moving forward. I'm going to introduce now our final speaker, and I'm sure that his talk will also uh, provoke quite a few questions that we can then go on and answer towards the end of the webinar. Uh, thank you to Jorge. Uh, Lee, would you like to take things uh, forward on your tips for coronoid fracture fixation? Great, thank you. So there were a few questions. Uh, um, how do I get to the anterior capsule and how to repair it? I'll try and cover that in this talk. Uh, on the tips and a little bit on how I assess the stability to within 30 degrees and how much is good enough. And there's a few clinical cases at the end. Maybe I'll uh, talk about that. So I chose this talk because I know Adam doesn't like the idea of tips on the coronoid. And I must say, I agree with Adam. There is no tip to the coronoid. Okay. Um, these are my disclosures. So this is the problem with the coronoid. We all started looking at the coronoid in these two dimensional structure, most, based mostly on Reagan Murray's classification from 1989. I became a consultant in 2005. I read O'Driscoll's classification and I thought, oh man, you're overcomplicating this. And I didn't quite appreciate the importance of that anterior medial facet, which uh, Adam has really borne out nicely in his Writington classification. This fact that the coronoid, depending on where it's broken, will almost fairly predictably define a different kind of injury and a different kind of uh, math method of treatment that you need to use. And about 2015, 2017, I saw this fracture. Now, this doesn't quite fit into Reagan Murray. Um, it doesn't quite fit into a Driscoll. This isn't a tip fracture. This is an an, in, isn't an anterior medial coronoid fracture, but it's this predominantly this anterior lateral facet of the, the coronoid. And just think about this picture. Uh, we may debate later whether you need to fix it or you don't. It's that middle column, um, but I just keep that in mind. And what I hope for in terms of my talk today is show you all the pathways to the coronoid so that you can pick and mix and match your coronoid, uh, your pathway, depending on the injury that your coronoid is sustained. So my first tip on the coronoid is that there is no single tip to the coronoid. Due deference to uh, Sean O'Driscoll, there, it is in his classification system, but there isn't really a tip to the coronoid. The coronoid is a beautiful structure in three dimensions. It has three ridges, the medial ridge, the intermediate ridge, and the lateral ridge. And in those classic terrible triad fractures, the piece that breaks off is this little piece of the intermediate ridge. And it's normally a little small piece. And it's mechanically not that important in terms of shunting and buttressing, but it does play a role, I think, in terms of this overhang working a bit like a bag hook. It stops that pseudo subluxation. It stops the drop sign, which you see on your lateral view. And although there may be no proprioception in that anterior capsule, repair of that capsule does reduce the amount of drop sign that I see. In answer to uh, Mr. Sankey's question, when I look for uh, whether the stable is, elbow is stable, I'm screening them on a true lateral and I want to make sure that that only humeral joint is nice and congruent. I'll accept a little bit of incongruence, a little bit of a drop sign, but I don't want too much, which is why for me, I want to repair that capsule. I know that with the suture fixation, I'm not going to be able to return the biomechanics for those small little pieces. When it's a big enough piece, and if you can buttress it and make it rock solid, then I do think you return the biomechanics of the elbow and make it rock solid stable. The second tip on the coronoid is nothing attaches to the lip. This is an arthroscopic picture which shows you that the capsule inserts about five millimeters from the top of the coronoid. And this study from Bain showing beautifully how the brachialis inserts onto the slope of the coronoid and doesn't insert onto the tip of the coronoid or the top of the coronoid. 
it's important to keep this picture in mind, particularly when you're trying to fit your coronoid plate. Because when you do it on saw bones, it's very easy. You can get it on the ridge, you can make it sit in the right place. But one of the problems is when you're doing it in the human, is you get caught up in the fibers of brachialis. And if you're not going enough around the front or you can't get the buttress right, or you can't get right onto the edge of the coronoid, it's because brachialis is in your way and you need to elevate it a little to get your plate to sit onto it. So remember this picture for later. And my third tip, which is uh, really echoes what uh, Jorge and what uh, Adam has been talking about, don't think of the coronoid in isolation. It's often in association with the terrible triad, a complex proximal ulnar fracture dislocation or injury to the collateral ligaments and very topical now being the posterior medial rotatory instability pattern. I'm gonna talk about the medial, lateral, anterior and arthroscopic assisted approaches to the coronoid. And on the medial side, you've got the Taylor sham interval between FCU and the ulna. You've got your FCU split and you've got your Hotchkiss. Taylor sham, you lift FCU off the subcutaneous border of the ulna and it gives you a beautiful view of the uh, shaft of the ulna, the olecranon, uh, this is very good for those proximal ulnar fracture dislocations. But the downside is that you do have to disturb the ulnar nerve from its bed. And I really don't like to mess with the ulnar nerve as much as possible. Man, the cat has to come right now. <laughs> I let the cat out the bag. Um, <laughs> where did we go to? Taylor Sham. The FCU split uh, is uh, where you split the, between the two heads of FCU. And that will bring you down to this fracture. This is the fracture of the sublime tubercle. This is the pure varus injury to the elbow, a little bit different to the PMRI because it's pure varus. You rupture your lateral collateral ligaments and you push off the coronoid. And that's the article that Ring wrote about in the anteromedial coronoid. He was talking about these sublime fractures. And they actually quite easily accessed for this one, for example, through the two heads of FCU. You could put a headless screw into this quite easy. You wouldn't have to worry about the first motor branch. You wouldn't have to disturb the ulnar nerve too much. It becomes a bit more difficult when you're trying to put a plate in that interval because you've got to work around the ulnar nerve and then the ulnar nerve is sitting on your plate and it just doesn't uh, go into debate whether this one needed to be fixed or not. And in fact, I didn't fix it. It was treated non-operatively. Your next interval is Hotchkiss. And the question is to ask not metaphorically where is Hotchkiss now in time and space, but where is the Hotchkiss interval? Because depending on the authors that you read, they will talk about splitting the flexor pronator muscle mass. But in fact, Hotchkiss talked about going between palmaris longus and FCU, a much lower split that some authors will show you, particularly if you're having a look at View Medi or you're reading an article on the, on the Hotchkiss. Make sure you know where they are splitting that flexor pronator muscle mass in this origin. And what the Hotchkiss gives you, it gives you top part of the coronoid. It gives you that little comminuted uh, anteromedial coronoid. It's not the one where it involves the sublime tubercle, the big anteromedial coronoid, the various injury, but that PMRI coronoid, that's the kind of one that you get through, through the Hotchkiss, whether it's what I would call a low Hotchkiss or classic Hotchkiss or the higher Hotchkiss splitting it through the flexor pronator muscle mass. So you have two articles working it out, which one's better, FCU or Hotchkiss, but make sure that you notice that this article here, they were splitting Hotchkiss much higher up, whereas here in the EMEA, extended medial elbow approach, which is a very nice approach to the coronoid, um, they were splitting it in that interval between Palmaris longus and FCU. And both said that, you know, on this they said it was FCU, here they said EMEA was better. But really, they're splitting in a very similar position, and they're coming up onto that top of the coronoid. And that's that anteromedial comminuted coronoid that you want to buttress. And that's the one where you want to go. That's the sort of approach. Uh, whether it's a, 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 you call it Hotchkiss or a, a split of the flexor pronator muscle mass or an over the top approach. Bear in mind where you want to go. And if you want to get more towards the top, you split your pronator muscle mass higher up. If you want to get more towards the base, you come a bit lower down. On the lateral side, you can see the coronoid through Boyd's interval between ulna and Anconius. You can see it through Crocker's interval and Conius and ECU. You can do the Kaplan, ERCB and EDC, or the EDC split, which was popularized or written up in 2014. Now, if you're trying to get to the coronary from the lateral side, you can only really do it when the radial head's not there. So if you're doing a Crocker or you're doing a Kaplan or EDC split, these two intervals here, uh, you basically do those to get to your coronoid when the radial head is completely fractured. And you can see your coronoid to line up your radial head but you can't do much to the coronoid. 
the real value of the Kaplan or the EDC split comes when you extend it up the lateral supracondylar ridge. The cocha is limited by that lateral collateral ligamentous complex in terms of the uh, classic cocha. And so generally the cocha is not a great view to get to the coronoid. The EDC splitter shown here will show you the top of the coronoid, will show you the intermediate ridge of the coronoid, the piece that breaks off in those turbal triads. So you can see it, but you can't do much to it. And if you want to then access it, you then have to strip off the whole capsule. I know there's not a lot of proprioception in the capsule, but there is a static tether of that capsule, which helps stop that drop sign, which helps to keep your ulnar humeral joint congruent, which makes you more confident when you're screening them on your lateral view, that that elbow is stable enough to be able to get them moving. So if you can give them the confidence in your eyes, you can get your elbow moving. I'll show you in a moment with the arthroscopic techniques, how you could use the Kaplan or the EDC split and still access that piece of the coronoid from the front with a switching stick or a direct anterior portal. Uh, if you wanted to put a screw from top to bottom, because one of the problems with the screws from bottom to top is if you have a look at how the sagittal pictures on a CT, it's only two or three osteones thick. And so you're only really getting two or three screw threads coming from the bottom. Uh, you do, I think, to give it real mechanical stability, come to it from the top. I like Boyd's interval. It gives me a great view from the back. Um, I can see the coronoid. If the radial head is not there, I can get a great view of the coronoid. If only part of the radial head is not there, you can rotate the radial head till that part's not, put a laminar spreader just in there and crank it open a little bit. And that's how you would get to the capsule. So to form a completely lateral approach, I can get to the anterior capsule and weave some sutures into the anterior capsule, forgetting about the little piece of coronoid that's broken off, that's irrelevant. I can drill transosseous drill holes through the subcutaneous border of the ulna, exiting around the front of the coronoid and shuttle the sutures back, that suture lasso. So for me, for the Boyd, doesn't add much to get hold of that anterior capsule. I can see my radial head outlines up with the lateral facet of the uh, coronoid so that it's not too proud. And I can repair my lateral collateral ligamentous complexes for the proximal ulnar fracture dislocations. I can piece all those pieces back together again side. I can quite easily come just on the other side of the ulna, Taylor Shams interval. I could come a little bit further anterior, the FCU split. And if I'm really working hard, as long as you take your skin flaps down to the fascia, I can get to a low Hotchkiss from a single posterior skin incision if I wanted to. And so that sort of a, the lateral approach is most times thought of when you're doing a terrible triad uh, sort of approach to the coronoid. Yeah, we see a, an article from uh, China, and this followed on from a discussion with Adam uh, about the anti approach to the coronoid and his experience with Bain. Uh, he's a genius, Bain. Uh, Adam Watch is a genius as well, uh, but uh, Bain, I love what he, what he writes. Um, and so I was a little worried about the stiffness, so I went and dug it out. And so here was an article from uh, 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 Medicine 2018 that looked at the anti approach to the coronoid. And they've got a good outcome with a range of movement of about 120 degrees with an arc of movement. And these are the pictures that they showed me. I'm still a little bit worried about this article. And I'm worried about this article because all they're doing is showing me a lateral view. And if you're showing me a lateral view, you're stuck in 1989 with Reagan Murray. You haven't even joined the Driscoll from 2013. It's time to join all of us here in 2020 with Adam Watts and the Writington classification. The problem with the anterior approach is there's lots of stuff in the front. It's quite easy to get through the veins. You then come between brachialis and pronator um, ter teres. You come to the lateral side, so the medial side of uh, uh, biceps, and then you just push the radial nerve, radial artery to the side, medial nerve to the side, and it brings you down to that facet. It brings you down exactly onto that little piece that you know you may or may not want to fix. Now, in the buttress model, it's the middle part, and it's probably not that important in terms of the shunting on the buttress. But I think it's quite important in terms of its ability to bring that bag hook back. Because if you get that back and that piece is big enough that you could buttress that with a mini T-plate, that will obliterate your drop sign and bring the stability back to the elbow in a heartbeat with enough confidence that you can then tell that patient, look, you can get your elbow moving immediately. And I suspect that that's what they achieved with most of these patients uh, in here, is they achieved enough stability to be able to get it moving. They went on then to show us this case. 
And here we see a fracture of the coronoid, and uh, it's a small piece off the top of the coronoid, Reagan Mori 1 possibly. But when I look at the plain films, you can see that this is not an, uh, an anterolateral facet. This is an anteromedial coronoid. This is the anteromedial coronoid that Ring wrote about, that pure varus injury. And you've got to come a long way past the uh, radial artery, past the median nerve to get to that facet, to get your plate around, to buttress it in. And so, yeah, they were wanting to promote the anterior approach, but don't get fixed in your head. There's only one approach. I'll do a medial approach. I'll do a Hotchkiss. I'll do an FCU. I'll do an anterior. Do your approach based on the other injuries, do your approach on the piece of the coronary that you get, need to get to. And so make sure you know what piece of the coronary is broken. Because here they've come from an anterior approach, but had to get all the way around to the medial side. To be honest, they would have been quicker and easier to just follow a classic Hotchkiss, uh, and they would have got down onto that piece of the coronary. Arthroscopic approaches, I like it. I've seen it from Adam, I've seen it from Roger Van Ritt. I'm still not too sure about it, mostly because of the fixation coming from the back and only having two or three osteons holding onto it. These people got around it by putting their screw from front to back. You can see the screw head is on the top and they did it essentially with a switching stick coming from the front to the back. And if you're doing your Kaplan, your EDC split and you want to buttress your, your you can't get to it, you can't instrument it from the lateral side, you may be able to instrument right from the front, but do go dig out this arthroscopic article and see how they talk about how they avoid the important structures on the front of the arm to be able to get down onto the front of that coronoid. Here's another case of arthroscopic fixation of the coronoid. And I must look at that coronoid and I think, mm, they didn't need to fix that coronoid. That to me, that's almost a tip of coronoid that would fit with uh, a Driscoll's tip that fits with, to me with almost PLRI. That's not come around enough medially to become an anteromedial facet because most of this anteromedial facet is intact. And so I'm even wondering if that coronoid needed to be fixed. They show us beautifully just lateral views, how the screws buttress perfectly. But what I want to see is on the AP view, where are those screws sitting? Are they in the right place? So I've got a few cases. Here's a 45 year old, he steps playing football and he felt a pop. And so I look at these plain films and I see here, Reagan Mori one, maybe two lateral film, but on the AP, that, is involving the medial part of the coronoid. That's your anteromedial coronoid, no doubt about it. I'm now getting nervous. I can feel the chills just running down my neck. Those are the pictures that Adam showed you of the elbow that's at risk. Because if you, five, 10 years, no, 10 years ago, let's pretend I'm a bit more up to date. 10 years ago, I would have just got this moving and I wouldn't have worried about it. But I've seen the elbows that will just disappear and disintegrate within six months. So, Okay, there's a little bit of incongruence here, but on the AP view, when you get a true AP, it looks beautiful. So I get a CT scan. So let's have a look at the CT. Uh, the actual views don't help me a lot, but it does show me that this fracture is going right across from the coronoid, from right from the lateral side to the medial side. Let's have a look at the sagittal view. So I'm here's radial head. I'm now coming across, just about to come into the coronoid. And I see, yes, that's exactly the intermediate ridge. That, but hold on a second. This is still continuing, further cuts coming towards me immediately. And the biggest piece is across here on the medial side. And you can just imagine how if this elbow sort of uh, dropped into that ridge, it would point load very quickly. But part of the CT is reassuring me. It's telling me this elbow is congruent, it's reduced. Yeah, there's not a big gap, there's not a big step. Oh man, the guy's 46. It's COVID times. Do I really want to subject him to an anesthetic? Uh, let's have another look. So here we're going at uh, a few more slices. Uh, and as always, they haven't got the gantry right. They haven't got the gantry angle. So I can't really see where this coronoid fragment is. But I'm worried because I've seen it on my x-ray. I can see that this is involving the anteromedial coronoid. You can't ignore this one. And with that sized piece, even though everything else is looking congruent, I can't just ignore it. I took him out of his back slab and he moved his arm and he felt fairly comfortable, but I wasn't happy. So I took him to theater and I gave him an EUA. So that's his various stress. And we see that he's ruptured his lateral collateral ligaments and he's pushed off that coronoid fragment. And this is what Ring was talking about, the anteromedial coronoid. It's that sublime tubicle piece that is broken off. I've got him in neutral again now. 
I've pronated the arm, so I know that this is my valgus stress. And I see that that he hasn't ruptured his lateral collateral ligamentus. So this is the classic PMRI various injury to the elbow. And there's the money shot. Bring him through for the lateral. And he's not 90, he's at about 60, he's subluxed. You leave him like that, he will wear out his elbow. And that's the problem. You bring him back to neutral, you put him in his back slab, you take your x-ray in the x-ray department, and it's reduced. You extend the elbow, and there he subluxes. And there he's out. And some patients, because the elbow is stupid, the elbow feels nothing, um, will run like that and wear out their elbow, and then will become with quite significant arthritis. And to stabilize this elbow, all you needed to do was put that piece of coronoid back, hug it nicely with that medatus plate. I'm not uh, telling one company over another, but it's the one coronoid plate that really stretches across the front of the coronoid to really buttress those, all those little broken anteromedial fragments because it's often comminuted. I'm sorry I haven't volume rendered it for you. I decided to go old school, you know, 3D recons as opposed to volume rendering on this one, just to show you how it went through it step by step. But once you've done that, that elbow is stable and congruent and you can then take it into full extension and you show that there's no drop sign and everything is sitting nicely. There's the x-rays at six weeks and there's the x-rays at four months uh, with the relatively well-preserved uh, on the humeral joint. Here's a 16 year old, he falls off his bicycle and I see that little bit of coronoid. I see my, my fat pad sign. I see that there's a little bit of mischief in that radial head. And now let's go have a look at the images. Sagittal tells me that there's a crack in the radial head, but I'm never gonna need to chop out that radial head. I don't need to fix that. That just needs to get moving. I see the beginning, right as we finished radial head, there's a piece broken off, but it's on the radial head side. It's that intermediate ridge fragment. And so I know that the mechanism of injury for this injury is not, I'll just uh, run the sagittals because this is beautiful. They get the slice right. This is O'Driscoll's classification, that piece there. And so this was a PLRI. This was not a PMRI. This able is, elbow is stable and congruent, small coronoid, not a significant radial head. If it's stable to within 30 degrees of extension, this can be treated non-operatively. This doesn't need to, to be worried about. The PMRI, the anterior medial coronoid, that's the one that you need to really, the, the hair needs to stand up on the back of your neck. 28 year old, this is one of the last cases. Uh, he gets a fracture and a coronoid injury. So this is a terrible triad by definition, dislocation, radial head, and coronoid. Um, sagittal images, I see small pieces on the radial head, but most of the radial head is attached to the shaft. Possibly in a 20 year old, I'll be able to fix that, maybe not. I see a coronoid fracture that starts all the way on the lateral side and is now still continuing all the way to the medial side. So this is almost an anteromedial coronoid. I also saw in that image that there was some subluxation of this elbow. So you can't treat that. Someone in the questions asked, can you treat this uh, uh, complex dislocation non-optically? Yes, you can, but there's a few criteria there. Small radial head, small coronoid. The cor radial head in itself doesn't give you a uh, reason to fix it. And the elbow needs to be congruent. You can't leave a subluxed elbow in my opinion, because if an elbow is subluxed, it's not good. I'm not sure if those axials were very good, but they came across, you could see it all the way across to the medial side. And this is the volume rendered 3D CT. I'm not sure how you would classify this, Adam. We'll talk about that maybe a little bit later. But to me, there's a big bit of coronoid. And now I'm thinking, how can I get to this coronoid? I can get to it to the lateral side, but I don't really want to chop out that radial head. And if I get to it from the lateral side, I can't do much to it. I could probably get to this radial head anteriorly with just a little buttress plate. And maybe I would be tempted to do that. Um, I could get to this from the medial side, but if I wanted to come to this from the medial side, I need to be the top part of the coronoid on the medial side. So I'm pitching, picking Hotchkiss. And if I had to cheat a little, I'm pitching, picking a Hotchkiss that's a little bit more anterior, if you know what I mean. I'll just swing it around so that you get a complete view of it. Maybe there's a little bit of PMRI. There's some opening because that poster band of the MCL might have gone looking at those images. Okay, so let's see what they did. So they tried to fix the radial head and they couldn't fix it and they replaced it. And that's important because if you can't fix it, you need to be able to replace it. Never set out to fix a radial head unless you've got a radial head replacement in there because one piece turns into two, two turns into three. And before you know it, you're in a bad situation and you need to either fix or replace it. 
So it's not the best solution in a 20 year old, but they fixed the radial head. They've buttressed the coronoid and they've also done transosseous sutures on the coronoid because you can see the drill holes from front to back there. And they've got the coronoid back in a good position, but that plate to me doesn't look right. And the reason they ran into mischief here is probably because brachialis was stopping them from getting their plate more distal and uh, stopping them from coming around. And maybe they came through an FCU split or they came a Taylor Shan. But that buttress fragment there needed to be buttressing that part that of the coronoid. Because if you go back and look where that coronoid's broken, sorry, the coronoid is broken more towards the middle part of the elbow. And so that buttress plate, to be honest, I'm not sure if it's doing anything really, it's probably just catching the end of the fracture. Uh, what mostly is working here though, is those transosseous sutures, which is pulling down that one little piece. But because they've got such a strong lateral buttress, they get away with it. They've replaced the radial head, they've made it rock solid. You'll notice that they've never had a cast or a back slab or a splint or anything on this. They've got it moving right from the start. Reasonable elbow, but for me, this coronoid plate needed to sit a bit more distal. So in summary, my first tip is that there is no single tip to the coronoid and due deference to uh, Sean O'Driscoll, we can talk about the tip of coronoid fractures, but you really need to be thinking about your coronoid injury in three dimensions. And you need to get a good CT so that you know exactly where that piece is that you're hoping to fix. Because if you're hoping to fix this little tip of coronoid from the medial side, you'll never get to it. You can't get to it from the lateral side because the radial head is still intact. So now your options are come straight from the front. And so for this one, I fixed him with a direct anterior approach with a little uh, hand plate T buttress. It restored the stability of the buttress and it gave me back my bag hook. This one, relatively stable. I didn't treat it with an operation. They got for early range of movement. This is your classic terrible triad. Here it's not about that little piece of bone. You don't need to fix that coronoid. Here, I still believe in fixing that anterior capsule because it gives me sense of mind so that I can give my patient sense of mind so that my patient can get their elbow moving because that's what stabilizes an elbow. Thank you. Um, fantastic. Uh, another fantastic talk from uh, Lee. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm just going to uh, open up uh, a final bit of discussion uh, we've had three fantastic talks and we've had a range of questions. Unfortunately, we, we won't have time to answer all of them. Uh, just one or two points uh, to begin with, Lee. Um, I'm really intrigued by the Boyd approach. I know that this is something that you use uh, a great deal, uh, especially when obviously you, you need to sort of address both the radial head and the um, uh, proximal ulna. Um, is it a good approach for doing a radial head replacement? I mean, it's obviously great for fixation. You get this fantastic uh, view of the uh, of the radius and you can really accurately place your plate fixation so that it doesn't impinge against the proximal ulna. But um, I've always wondered, uh, you know, wh whether it's a, a great way of uh, accessing the radial neck and head in order to do a replacement. So, in fact, it was a, an approach written up in Wrightington and Wrightington wrote it up for radial head replacements in the arthritic situation, the chronic situation. And in fact, that's why they did the supernatal crest osteotomy. So Wrightington, because with arthritis, you get quite a significant bony osteophyte, uh, enthesophyte or uh, growing along the annular ligament. They osteo osteotomize that. And you get a beautiful view of the back of the radial head. You can come all the way down the, the radial neck as far as you want, because you'll never encounter the pin. And that's for me, I've had a mischief with the pin in the past by your mischiefs, don't they? Um, I can see the lateral facet of the coronoid so that I can make sure that my radial head is not too proud. I can afterwards get that elbow moving up and down and make sure that my radial head is tracking my capitellum beautifully. Um, and so for, for me, Boyd is good for elective radial head replacements. Um, it's very good, I think, for trauma. One of the downsides, though, in these proximal ulnar fracture dislocation is there is a possibility for cross union between the radial head and neck and the ulna. And the way you prevent that is the way you prevent heterotopic ossification, where you prevent too much bone forming. And you get that by giving your patient the confidence to get their elbow moving. So, yes, you can do electives. Um, you can do trauma. I think you get a beautiful view of the radial head. For the terrible triads, you can, because the dissection's already been made for you, 
Now, one of the mischiefs here is the lateral collateral ligament complex has been injured here on the capitellum, and the lateral collateral complex has now been injured on my supinated crest. I accept that. But with an anchor into the center of the capitellum and a fiber wire repair of my lateral collateral ligament in common extensor origin, and a transosseous fiber wire repair of my annular ligament around the neck, that sort of construct you could ride a horse on. If you can't, if you find that your annular ligament repair or your, your lateral ulnar collateral ligament repair isn't sound, you can still take two, one set of your fiber wire sutures, a double-edged suture, from there, outside the capsule, through drill holes to the subcutaneous border, and create an internal brace. Essentially, what Jorge is doing is with the internal external fixator is that bringing stability to the elbow so that they can move it. I don't care how you do it. But what you need to do is make sure that the elbow is stable enough. And so for me, through Boyd. Now, you do need to come and split triceps a little bit coming down here, which is a bit more than what uh, Wrightington did. And that's how you get more access. You don't denervate Anconius because the nerve to Anconius comes from the uh, radial nerve into the lateral aspect of triceps. And it comes along here in this direction. So it's not a, a denervation procedure. Uh, fantastic answer. And I think the one thing that I will uh, try to uh, nail you and Adam down to, and Jorge as well, if he'll, if he'll travel to London, in one of our previous, um, after one of our previous Ortho Hub events, uh, one of our previous speakers uh, posted some fantastic videos of surgical approaches, and in particular around the ankle. They went down extremely well, and they were really well received. And I think that what would really uh, be fantastic is if we could organize perhaps uh, for you and Adam to maybe spend a day with us uh, to organize some videos of you guys doing these approaches and just demonstrating uh, the Boyd, the Hotchkiss, FCU splits uh, and other techniques to get to various parts of the elbow, because this is one of these uh, always constantly challenging uh, technical parts of elbow surgery and to have your insights, that would be great. Just one or two final questions before we wrap it up. Uh, one. Uh, a question that caught my eye earlier, and I'll pitch this to uh, the other guys on the panel, is in the uh, setting where uh, the radial head has been replaced, and then over the passage of time, over sequential x-rays, we see that there's this gradual tendency towards aseptic loosening uh, around the neck uh, and potential uh, instability and, and sort of a windscreen wiper effect of the radial uh, stem, is this something that you just kind of treat expectantly and see how it evolves? Is there uh, a universally bad endpoint, or is there a potential for the stem on the or the osteolysis to stabilize with time? Uh, Adam, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, you're on mute, actually. There, Adam. There isn't a very quick answer to this, but I'll make it as brief as I can. Um, first of all, uh, the first question I'd ask is, how do you know it's aseptic? Uh, and always consider infection uh, when you see early loosening. Um, the other causes of, of early loosening are persistent instability. So has the coronoid been properly addressed or is all the load being taken by the radial head, which is why it's, it's failed? Or have the soft tissues not been fixed again, so the, the radial head's taking all the load? Has the radial head been put in badly, which is quite common, or is it just a bad prosthesis, which is, there are some out there. So those are the sort of things that I would be asking myself about the, the early failure of a, of a radial head uh, uh, replacement. And then the issue is, it, so once you identify what the problem is, then you treat that problem. So there isn't a one size fits all. Yeah, great answer. Jorge, any thoughts from you? A well-designed and well-applied radial head that has a, a bone ingrowth surface should not loosen. Uh, the reasons to loosen is overstuffed heads, carry more loads than necessary, um, bad designs, heads with uh, short necks. Uh, the, remember, there's a lateral force. It's up to 20% of the applied axial load, which can be easily uh, uh, 15 kilograms. So it, it, you, if, if, if you don't get immediate fixation, and you start early rehabilitation, uh, you will loosen your, your stem. Okay. Um, so a very final brief summary of uh, the talks. 
Uh, I'm just going to share my screen uh, very briefly. Um, so we've had three fantastic talks uh, and there are some uh, takeaway points which uh, I have been uh, just taking notes on. And I'm sure that these are uh, the same things that you guys will be uh, thinking about as well. First of all, uh, Adam's talk on the writing to classification. Uh, my takeaway points was that there is an asymmetric stability really to the elbow. The medial and lateral sides are not necessarily equivalent. Uh, and that's really a re reflection of the, uh, the, the three columns, which are um, a great way to consider elbow stability. Uh, the single most important takeaway talk, uh, takeaway point from that talk was that the uh, uh, the bony anatomy and the pattern of bony injury really has to uh, empower accurate prediction of soft tissue injury. And in terms of surgical decision making, this is incredibly important. The way that we uh, approach every treatment from that point forward can be based around that. In a terrible triad, uh, the anteromedial facet is uh, often intact. And Adam wondered whether or not he needed to be fixed at all. Uh, and uh, that's maybe a, a, a current concept which uh, uh, is worth considering by all of us. And one other really important uh, uh, aspect to all of this is the rehab and the elimination of uh, biceps tone or hypertonia of the bicep by utilizing gravity and working uh, against gravity to, to defunction that hypertonic uh, aspect of uh, bicep inhibition of elbow movement, I think is a really important uh, take home from that talk. Next, uh, Jorge's talk on the uh, radial head. So uh, the, the primary point is that the radial head is the primary longitudinal and valgus stabilizer of the elbow and can be enough to restore stability in a terrible triad without fixation of the coronoid. Um, I think that now, <clears throat> We are all completely agreed that there is no place for radial head resection in the midst of instability of an elbow injury. And I really like the concept of using, <clears throat> excuse me, a long stem prosthesis for improved stability of a radial head replacement. Finally, uh, I uh, took away Lee's really interesting point about the uh, overhang that the intermediate facet gives and the, uh, the way that the capsular attachment onto the intermediate facet can um, help with the inferior subluxation that we quite often see in the perioperative setting. <clears throat> Again, the brachialis attachment is not to the tip of the coronoid as uh, common uh, teaching dictates. And actually there's a much broader footprint along that medial slope of the coronoid. Um, if you have a sublime tubercle fracture that you need to access, probably FCU split is the way forward and the Hotchkiss through the interval between palmaris and FCU are probably better to reach uh, the higher or more superior part of an anteromedial facet injury. And the final take home point was beware of the medial coronoid facet and the posteromedial rotatory instability is something uh, that can wreck uh, an elbow uh, really very quickly. Um, a final thank you to all of our speakers who I think have done an outstanding job. Uh, a big thank you to uh, everyone who has tuned in. Uh, we will continue the elbow theme with a, um, a, a podcast that Lee is going to do for us soon. And hopefully I'm going to invite both Adam and Lee to um, share some uh, videos uh, regarding surgical technique and how to reach these difficult parts of the elbow. Uh, thank you to everyone who's tuned in and I hope that you've enjoyed the evening. Thank you very much.